Hey Sanjay, how you doing, sir? Good, Rajiv. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. Thanks for making a few minutes. We're I'm excited to learn more about all the cool stuff you have going on at Data Nautics. Anytime, we love to talk about what we do. So <laughs> that's wonderful. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I'd love to kind of maybe start with um, a bit of history and maybe describe where you know what does Data Nautics do kind of a history, a little bit of how you got to where you are, and of course your role within Data Nautics as CEO. Okay, so we're a pretty uh, simple company. Our whole job and uh, purpose for existence is to help our clients understand how their customers feel about them, right? So it's all about if you're a restaurant, if you're a theme park, if you're a basketball team, how do your fans guess visitors perceive you. And the way we do that is very simply relying on open-ended feedback, right? So it's either a combination of kind of online reviews where you essentially have a rating and I went to X and I enjoyed this and I didn't like this. Um, or our, in a lot of cases, our clients would actually ask their customers, you came and you visited me, tell me about your experience. Right? And what's really cool is when people talk about the experience, unlike a traditional survey where you have you know, 20, 30, 40 dimensions you're asking about, how is the food, how is the ambiance, how is the service? When I simply ask you, tell me about your experience, you tell me the things that were personally memorable, right? the things that stood out for you. And if I ask you, you know, right after you leave the restaurant, you're gonna tell me what's in short-term memory. If I ask you roughly two or, day, two or more days after, you're telling me what, what you retained in long-term memory. Right now, your experience is the biggest driver of what you're going to do in the future. Right? If you had a great experience, you're gonna go back again. You had a great experience, you come to me and say, Sanjay, you should try this restaurant, or you should go to this theme park, because it was a memorable experience for you. Right? And so what we're trying to figure out is, what are the internal memories that drive people to loyalty or disloyalty, to satisfaction and recommendation or dissatisfaction and shouting out from the rooftops uh, on social media using negative language, right? Um, and then we've built an artificial intelligence engine. Her name's Anna. And Anna actually literally like a human reads. So she'll read the content, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of comments. And she'll um, kind of understand, synthesize the themes, the patterns, uncover them, and then kind of do analytics on top of that to say, you know, this is how people generally feel. However, millennials are more likely to feel this way than boomers are. So now that data that was just open-ended, very qualitative, people just read it and maybe read a, a few hundred to get a sense of what was going on to now you can do, you know, hundreds of thousands of these and get actionable insights that tell you here are the behaviors you want to keep repeating. Here are the things you want to change. And here are potential ways in which you can get expanded wallet share. So how do you grow and how do you expand the customer's um, revenue and business with you? That's awesome. So uh, it sounded like uh, you are actually correlating different data sources. So you're not just looking at one type of data source. So social, you, said, you mentioned social media, you mentioned surveys. You mentioned comments. Uh, was that was that what you were doing? You're, you're correlating information across sources. Yeah. So the the idea is we're experts in the open ended stuff, right? So we specialize literally in the qualitative aspect. Now, qualitative data comes from online reviews, for instance. Uh, you go to Google reviews or Facebook reviews, what have you, Yelp, TripAdvisor. You can ask in a primary survey. So you you know you could ask your customers. You came to my restaurant. You came to my theme park. Tell me about your experience. Or in some cases, um, you can derive it from other sources, right? So people just talking on um, social media channels. And uh, you know, that tends to be a bit more noisy, but you can still extract out certain things. So it's, it's either solicited or unsolicited. And then depending on whether you, it's unsolicited or solicited, you can have other data that goes with it, metadata. In the case of pure online reviews, there is no metadata, right? All you know is when the comment was made, how, what it was reviewed at, and what they said. Um, you could derive maybe gender if you have a username. On the flip side, if it's sourced or solicited feedback, 
then you have the ability to ask a bunch of um, demographic questions, or you can marry it to your CRM database and extract out you know demographic and psychographic data from there. Got it. Got it. That's very cool. So yeah, uh, how did you come across this business model? I mean, uh, the business need now that you say it in those words is obviously pretty significant. How did you come across it, and what made you want to? So the, you know, the the need's been there since businesses have existed. So it's it, it's not a new need, right? And what's interesting is if you think about how we tried to meet that need, think back decades ago or a couple of hundred years ago. You were a small business. You were a bakery in town. Um, and you sold baked goods. New person moves to town, they move into a house. First thing they do is they say, I need bread. They go ask their neighbor and they say, who do you buy bread from? And they would say, there are three bakers in town. You go to Sanjay's, you'll get this. You go somewhere else, you'll get that, right? So I, I would rely on kind of that word of mouth, customers talking to each other. Um, and then I'd rely on customers telling me something was wrong so I could fix it. Right? We formalized that a bit because some baker got smart and said, you know, rather than relying on these accidental collisions to happen, let me gather a group of people, villagers, right? And let me ask them, what do you like uh, about the bakery you shop at? What are your main needs, right? So we, we do that discovery in what is now formally called a focus group. You get a bunch of people together. Now you have a moderator. So the focus, the business is uh, distanced. And not you're not biasing the responses, but the focus group idea is is really kind of that deep listening, right? Let me help me understand what you're thinking, how you're feeling, what matters to you. And I do it over a group of 10, 15 people, and maybe if I've got enough money, I do it over four or five groups, and maybe get to 100 people, right? So that idea of a focus group gives you a lot of really good stuff, but that stuff, Rajiv, is not statistically valid and representative, right? A, a group of 15 people can't tell you how to structure your business as Amazon, for instance. So what you do is you take these 15 and then we would design these surveys. So we would say, okay, here are these 15 people talked about these 20 dimensions. On these 20 dimensions, I'm gonna ask these questions and I'm gonna create a survey instrument. And we, you and I have all answered these types of survey instruments. Right. And those survey instruments are fielded out. They have you know, 30, 40, 50 questions. And then you send it out to 100, 200, 1,000 people, and you get responses back, now you start getting to statistical validity. So that's been the old process of how do I understand what matters to my customers, how they feel about what I do for them. The place that is weak is imagine if you and I both go to the same restaurant, but we go for different reasons. You go with your family for a family reunion. I go for a business meeting. Where you're going for a family reunion, it's 30 people. Noise doesn't matter to you. Heck, you're probably the source of the noise, right? And I go for a business meeting, a one-on-one -on -one with a client. Noise suddenly becomes important. Now, you and I can both be asked the question about noise in a survey. How noisy was the restaurant? And we may both score it a five on a 10-point scale. And that's useful to know, right? And some analysts or some system averages those out and says the average is a five. However, Noise to you was not an important factor. Noise to me was because I went for a business meeting, you went for a social event. So I don't get to ask you, is noise important? Because I double the length of the survey, right? So I just get to ask you about noise. So what happens with the old survey process is I get to ask you about things that the business decided are, are relevant and important to them may not necessarily be relevant or important to you individually. If I simply asked you in an open, it came to my restaurant, how was it? And you say it was a blast. They were able to fit all 30 of us in there. We had a lot of fun. They asked me the same question, open-ended, tell me about your experience. And I say, it was really noisy. I was trying to have a, a business discussion with my client and I couldn't do that. We had to leave and go to another place. So noise wouldn't have shown up in your comment. It didn't matter to you. Noise showed up in mine, right? So traditionally, the, the, we've built these scientific processes and methodologies and all of that using social sciences to try to get a sense of what the heck matters to people, but it's actually a flawed way of looking at it. The ideal thing, honestly, is imagine if you walk into the, the um, Amway Center when the magic are playing and you want to know how the fans feel about the magic. If you could read their minds, you'd know in an instant 
across the whole fan base, how they feel. We can't read minds. The next best thing to reading minds is to say, let's just ask, right? And that's something that's never been done because if you ask a thousand people and they give you a paragraph, how the heck are you going to read it and quantify it and act on it? So that's always been the weakness. So, so the, the space we occupy has been a space that's been around for probably a century. How do customers feel about me? What do customers want? Right. The way we're solving that problem has only been enabled recently because of artificial intelligence and technology is getting to a point where we've built an engine literally um, ourselves that works out of the box and can read comments about restaurants right now. And she can read comments about theme parks next and banking after that. And she can read them in multiple languages. She couldn't care less what people are talking about. She just knows how to read. Right, so that's the big evolution, which I think is just really cool because it allows for a new way of thinking about what matters to people and how they feel about me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I like how you uh, really made that into a, in a journey of how people have been trying to get closer and closer to what the customer really thinks. But what got you into that space? So how did you know about that problem statement? What was your background that brought you to it? So we were... Uh, I've, I've had a consulting business uh, for about 15 years and trigger events for clients to call us up for consulting were, hey, I've got um, a problem. My customer satisfaction scores are going down. Can you please um, help? And we would get all of their customer sat data and we would sit like, like, regu- like you know, um, the humans typically do. You put quali- kind of these qualitative comments in a in a column in a spreadsheet. And then you create these other columns about was it positive, yes, no, was it negative, yes, no, was it about food, was it about service? So we we essentially code, right, comments, human comments, um, and use humans to do it. Now you have two types of humans that can do it. You get these very expensive people like my company was. So you get the high-end consultants that are critically reading every comment and quantifying it. Or you could create a mechanical process where you hire your um, you know, $15 an hour people and you train them and you tell them these are the eight columns I want you to fill out and here's how to separate between the eight. Here's how to say yes or no or uh, whatever it is, right? Gotcha. Um, and, and those are the ways that people would do that stuff. And and it we had, we had a lot of that kind of hand-coded, human-coded data. My son was in college you know, working on a computer science degree in artificial intelligence. And he was looking over my shoulder saying, you know, how the heck is dad paying for this? And he jokingly says, dad, machines can do this now. AI can do this. And I was laughing. I'm like, yeah, no, I, I've got a master's in AI from a long time ago. And I was like, AI can't do this. So that was the challenge, right? So he started kind of working on our data set, which had a lot of human trained data to create machine learning algorithms. So he spent a couple of years kind of just playing around with that. And, and it got closer and closer to what we as humans could do. Um, And it got a little better and a little better. So when he graduated from college uh, about four and a half, five years ago, was um, kind of that uh, turning point for us. So I offered him the opportunity to come and work with me and kind of, you know, let's turn our consulting business into a software business. We've got all this hand-coded, hand-trained data. Can we actually build real algorithms that think and behave like humans are when they're reading? And then can we commercialize it? So that's how we pivoted from a consulting company to a software company. For the first three years, we were still almost uh, 80, 20, 60, 40 by the end. And then at the end of three years, we decided we're done consulting. We just, it was too distracting to try to do both. And we put all of our eggs into the um, SaaS technology basket. And it's worked out well. We're, We're actually now above where we were in revenues from a consulting perspective and and probably 10 times more profitable. That's awesome. Yeah, that really uh, actually kind of follows the lean startup process to a certain degree because you basically did the concierge manual uh, approach. Mm-hmm. You proved the value was there. You did it manually and delivered the value and, uh, and then you kind of automated that process out. So from that point of view, I guess, um, what are you doing to, I mean, did you have to go through any pivots in terms of how you uh, go about doing this or any bottlenecks that you ran into? 
Yeah, we didn't. And and unlike a lot of other kind of tech startups that have an idea and then go out and try to validate the idea with a scratch and sniff, it doesn't work. You pivot, and then depending on how how far you are, your pivots are huge or or small, right? I was already working in a problem domain where I knew the problem existed. I spoke the language of that domain. I had clients that had asked us to solve that same type of problem for them with a different type of an approach, right? So the problem wasn't, we, we knew the problem existed. We weren't trying to solve a problem um, that didn't exist or we weren't trying to solve a problem that existed but didn't have enough budget behind it. We, I knew that this was a problem that was real and this was a problem that company was spending money on, right? And pivots typically happen when you figure out either you've got this harebrained idea that nobody thinks is a real problem, which is a bad thing to be doing, or you've, you've identified a real problem, but you realize the problem isn't worth enough for companies to spend money on. Not every problem has to be solved, right? Um, and the only problems worth working on are the ones where somebody's got a checkbook that they will open up and pay you to solve for them. And so we already knew that going in, that this was a domain that had that open up a checkbook and pay to solve the problem mentality to it. We were just coming in with a new tool. Got it, got it. Yeah, so from a CIO, CTO perspective, um, you've got a solution that um, basically is plug and play, right? So any CIO, CTO that is looking into the domain of how do we analyze uh, customer information, especially textual information coming in from multiple different sources, they really shouldn't try to build their own is what we're saying at this point. That problem has been pretty much solved by your tool. It would just be easier for them to go rent this tool from you for whatever purposes they have. Absolutely. And I'll tell you why that's true more so than not true, right? I mean, as an entrepreneur and as a CEO of the company, my job is to say yes to that question. But the pragmatic answer really candidly is the, the shortage of resources that we hammer away at are in two dimensions, two domains, right? One is as a CIO, CTO, there aren't enough people out there that you can hire to solve every problem that your organization needs to solve, right? The, the technology, technologists and coders and AI professionals are really, really hard to find, right? So, so regardless of whether you think you can do it or not, there are no people available to help you do it. So that's just a pragmatic reality, right? Um, so anything that you can carve off and give to somebody else because they've got the domain expertise is good. The other part that there is an equally critical shortage in is data analytics people. Analytics people are in very, very high demand, right? So the, the, you know, the, the demand outstrips supply by a factor of four or five. Now that's where our system becomes really valuable. Our system is not just, here's an AI platform, you can plug into it and then you can have your analysts sit there and ask it questions. We've, we've been fortunate enough to have some really solid clients locally in Orlando that have let, let us look over the analyst shoulder. So early on, we were a system and we would lease, you know, sass it out. So people would sit there, put their own analysts at the keyboard and the mouse and asking questions of the system, formulating hypotheses, coming up with the answers, yes or no, if the hypothesis was true or not. Um, and we were looking over their shoulders. So we had a client that used to, that runs promotions. They run on a, essentially a two and a half month, 12 week promotion cycle. At the end of the promotion period, they collect all their data, they do the analysis, it takes them well over a month to do it. And then they'd be ready for making changes to the promotion a year later. That was their cycle. And that's all they could do because of the availability of technology and qualitative data analytics and stuff. Now, uh, when we first implemented for them, they went from taking a month to do the analysis to literally being able to do it in a week. And, we, and they were thrilled, right? Because they saved 75% of the effort. But we're looking over their shoulder and we're realizing in that amount of effort they're putting in in a week, there are things we could do to automate it to get it down to a day. So we did. So we went from five days of analysis to a day of analysis. That's because we could look over their shoulders and see what they were thinking. And some of the things they were thinking were mechanical. Let me try this and then I'll try it for this and I'll try it for this. So they were repeatedly trying the same thing across different metadata, you know, made age and gender and race and 
um, socioeconomic uh, wealth and all of that stuff. So like these are tasks that can be automated, right? So now we've gone to a point where that day has gone down to maybe an hour at most. Let's imagine somebody used to spend a month and they can get the same insights from our system that they used to in a day, in an hour. So that is the two dimensions, right? Regardless of what the CTO, CIO decides to do, there is a shortage of people once the system is implemented to even be able to use the system. And, and so we've kind of gone in with all guns blazing and solving those two problems simultaneously. So our AI engine is not just an NLP, NLU machine learning engine. She's also kind of a, a rapid analytics engine. So she'll formulate the hypothesis. I mean, she can run millions of hypotheses. So, you know, let's hypothetically say they're talking about a particular thing. They're talking about the food at a restaurant and the, the menu items. And you, you go in and say, okay, great. You know, 40% of them are talking about menu items generally in a much in a very positive way. So it's a great thing for a restaurant. You can actually tell the system, tell me something more about the food items. And she'll go through and depending on what metadata she's got, she'll come back and she'll tell you menu items are more frequently talked about by women. It seems much more relevant to the baby boomer and older group than the younger population seems to be relevant more frequently at dinner than at lunch, right? So she does the analysis. And what that does is it frees up organizations to fix what is broken and to ensure that they replicate what is working well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you said you mentioned some clients in Orlando. Uh, I was going to ask about that. How does um, being in Orlando uh, work? Is, is it helping you in some ways? And maybe is, is it a, a friction in other ways? It's helped in a few ways. We're, I think, surprisingly, one of a very small handful of AI startups that are completely self-funded. And we're not just self-funded. I mean, we're profitable. We're cash flow positive. We're growing at a rapid rate. So we've been able to accomplish what out in the Silicon Valley or any other place would have probably required investors. I think the technology space from a startup perspective is at a point of inflection. What's really fascinating is, you know, if I needed to develop this 10 years ago, I probably would have needed 15 to $20 million to develop it. That's just the reality of it. And pre-AWS or um, other cloud providers, uh, cloud hosted service providers, we would have needed a data center that was well into the seven figures to even get this up and running, right? So the, the amount of money you needed to get started was significant. That is actually no longer true because there's so much good stuff out there in the public domain in terms of algorithms, in terms of um, core functionality. And where it's not necessarily um, good in the public domain, you've got you know, things like Google and Amazon that have these microservices and APIs to some very robust capabilities that developing software has become a much, much easier process. That being in Orlando has actually been an advantage for us because what it's allowed me to do, Rajiv, is I don't need to spend the Silicon Valley rates, right? My rent is a lot cheaper. Uh, resources we hire are a lot cheaper. Everything is cheaper, which means my dollar stretches more. My pricing is, is not, it, it, you don't go to the Silicon Valley and just because you're out of the Silicon Valley, you don't get to charge more. Right, client problems have a value to them and you can extract that value. And so we get the same price any company anywhere across the country would get. We're able to do it a lot cheaper, which allows our dollar to stretch a lot more. Right now, the, the reason that has been critical is four or five years ago, one of our clients is, is a national restaurant chain. And we walked in and um, me being who I am, I just said, you know, this, multi-question survey that you guys give at the, to your diners at the end of a meal should not be done that way. You should simply just say, you ate at my restaurant, tell me what you like, tell me what I can improve. And that's it. And they laughed and they said, we've been doing this so long, it's never gonna change. Today, that restaurant chain has a device on a tabletop. So once you're done eating, you pay and it asks you rate your experience and tell me about your experience. Right? Now think about those two questions. Rate your experience, tell me about your experience. That's very familiar, right? That's Amazon reviews. 
that's Google reviews, that's Facebook reviews, that's TripAdvisor, uh, Yelp, you name it. And that's how people are used to consuming feedback and therefore giving feedback, right? So over the last four or five years, the market has shifted from, uh, I think it's a luxury to be able to do the open-ended text analytics, but I'm going to stick with my 20, 30 questions up front, to now companies coming saying, yeah, this is nuts, you're right. The gold is buried in the open-ended and people aren't responding to my 30 question survey because they're used to shorter surveys. It becomes even more critical when you look at demographics by um, generation, right? I'm a boomer, I'm happy. Leave it taking 15 minutes to give feedback. My kids who are all in their 20s, they'd look at a survey and they'd laugh. They'd never fill it out, right? Unless it was one of these short, rate it, tell me about your experience, because that's what they're used to consuming. They'll be happy to act in that manner. Yeah. So I think um, being in Orlando has allowed us to get to the point we are um, and succeed to the extent we have, uh, partly because of the cost structures. The other thing that's been really phenomenal, honestly, is we have a lot of really solid local clients um, because we wanted to start locally. You know, the, when, you're, when you're bootstrapping, you don't have time to, you don't have money to get on a plane and fly all over the country trying to figure out what people need. Orlando stepped up. We've got clients that are local that have let us look over their analyst shoulders, uh, that have introduced us to other clients out of town. So the, the local ecosystem has supported us in ways that I didn't think existed um, until we were out there and needed it. But it was amazing how many people stepped up. So I think Orlando is a great place to start a, a tech company. That's wonderful. Good to hear. So Sanjay, what are your... Um current plans and kind of what are your aspirations uh, for next steps here? How are you scaling out the solution? What are your uh, goals? So we're, um, we've started kind of, we started our national expansion, kind of moving out of the Orlando and Florida region uh, early last year and then COVID hit. So, you know, we, we've kind of taken a hiatus for about a year or a bit more in terms of um, very aggressively expanding on a national basis, but we just secured um, an e-commerce client out of New York City uh, that we went live with uh, on July 1st. We've got discussions underway with probably um, three different professional sport, sports entities that are all outside or outside Florida. So we're, we're, we're kind of beginning to go a bit more national uh, but but I think what was interesting was, you know, two years ago, you almost had to get on a plane and go visit clients that are out of town because of COVID. Everybody's happy just meeting with us on Zoom. So that's been a huge advantage um, in terms of ability to quickly go from, hey, are you interested to doing a quick uh, song and dance? Doing we, we do a free pilot proof of concept where somebody, if someone's interested, we say, great, sign an NDA, give us a set of data you've already got. and under NDA, we won't charge you, we'll do a proof of concept, right? So if I can find three things that are buried in your data that you didn't know, that proves to you there's valuable data, there's valuable insights in your data. I don't need to prove that to you or hypothesize it's true. I just will prove it to you at no cost to you. And then we go to the business discussion of, so how much is it really worth? How much would you be able to pay? And for that, what could we do for you? So the sales cycles have become a lot shorter. Um, and we have a lot more of those in progress. So we're, we're kind of happy where we are. Gotcha. And so this is an ongoing, once you figure out how many data sets you're talking about and what kind of insights you're looking for, you have a little bit of planning there. And then it's an ongoing month-to-month -month subscription from there? It, yeah, so it varies. Some people uh, do the pure SaaS. So we just license our technology to them. They have their own analysts um, and they do the analysis and they do the reporting. We have other clients that we call managed services. So they just outsource the entire problem to us. So it's not the, just the technology. It's not just the, the CTO, CIO saying, here's a partner, use them. It's the analytics team saying, we don't have resources. We just want you to do the analysis. So we become an extension of their teams, doing the reporting, doing the analysis, all of that. And we're seeing more of the latter than the former. Like I said, you know, there's such a shortage of um, analysts and analytics people that 
um, teams are happy to say, I've got somebody who's an expert in qualitative data analytics. I don't care if they're part of my organization or not. We behave like we are, right? They need something very quickly. We turn it around in minutes. Um, so it becomes a, we become a reliable extension. And that's where I think it's very sticky. Very cool. Yeah, I think there's a learning there for C-level folks too, because a lot of CIOs and CTOs, um, they don't really speak the language of the business as much. And sometimes there's a learning there in just what business is expecting, what kind of insights they're looking for. And then that takes a while to translate before C, uh, the technical leaders even get into the problem. So yeah. what, um, for you to be someone who's an extension of the team, like uh, what are, you know, I guess, what are, what are the analysis methodologies or anything that you can talk about with respect to your processes that, that help you with that? Um, not particularly, because what we find is really fascinating is open-ended data is truly the closest thing to reading a customer's mind. Right? So if you ask a very open-ended question and you get a response back and you get enough of those responses, our system does all the work. We really, honestly, if we're doing a report, 90% of the report is copying things out and pasting them into a PowerPoint or a keynote slide and then generating a PDF. Right? So the, the bulk of the heavy lifting is built into our software, into our algorithms, into the way the system does analysis. Right, so we just have to go and say, okay, you know, uh, we've got a large um, healthcare prospect we're looking at, and they've got 400 providers, 140 locations spread out across the country. And so they gave us their patient satisfaction data. We tossed it into the system. The system came back and said, there are these four main themes that seem to be recurring over time. And the four themes was soft skills, so, you know, polite, uh, friendly, helpful. Hard skills, they were knowledgeable, they were thorough, they were professional. Um, kind of wait time related stuff. And then more kind of infrastructure and ambience, you know, the, the waiting rooms and the cleanliness and all of that. So those are the four dimensions. The system uncovered those. We basically, and, and with that system we had, with all of the data, so we had the open-ended comment, we had a review score rating, and then we had, you know, location and the name of the provider and everything. And we said, great, tell me about the soft skills. And the system went through and said, soft skills statistically are mentioned much more frequently in a positive way at these particular locations and for these particular providers. And statistically in a negative way, in a much less frequent way for these locations and these providers. Right? That was our pilot, that was the pilot data set. We walk in and we tell them, here are your, uh, out of 140 locations, here are your top 15. And here are the bottom 20 that are statistically outliers. And they were shocked, right? I mean, they just fell off the chair saying, how did you figure that out? Um, and so that's kind of the reporting we do. We're not really even doing a lot of deep analytics. Gotcha, gotcha. No, that's very useful. So we're almost at time here, but I wanted to make sure that um, I tap your knowledge and experience. And you know, what you've done basically is you've taken a consulting business and you've created a AI-based SaaS platform, plus you know, some uh, additional services, managed services on top of that. Uh, okay. And in that journey, I'm sure you've gone through a lot of different experiences and used a lot of different resources. Any resources that you would care to call out, maybe share with the audience, like books, videos, processes, methodologies, templates? Um, it's like you mentioned the term lean or agile. Right. I mean, we have by design and by necessity done what I call common sense approaches, right? So we're putting in our own money. And I think this is a big difference between a startup that's got 40 million bucks and a startup that doesn't. Is the startup with 40 million bucks has investors that are saying, so what are you doing with my money? How quickly is the platform developing? We do it the other way, which is we look at a feature and let's say a client asks us for it. And we look and we're like, okay, that sounds interesting for you. And I can see why you'd want that. And it'll save you X amount of time. Or it's a brand new feature, which you can't even do right now. But then we go to other clients or prospects and say, would this be useful? Right? So our approach to development has been what I call very pragmatic. Is, is this going to solve a real problem for people across the board? 
or is it going to solve a specific problem for a client? So, you know, I think if you went back and you looked at um, lean development um, or agile, any of those things, uh, we, I, the, the real name for my business is actually Kaizen Consulting. So Kaizen is that whole concept of continuous improvement. All of that stuff is just baked into how we do it. And the reason it's completely baked in Rajiv is if you've got common sense and limited resources, you quickly figure out how to deploy those resources to maximize how far they take you, right? I think the biggest, um, the biggest benefit and the biggest disadvantage of well-funded companies is money. You're well-funded, it allows you to move very quickly and do certain things. It also makes you very sloppy, right? Uh, because it's easy to make mistakes. It's easy to take a client's input and say, oh, that's great, let's build a feature. We have built a platform that works across industries and across domains and is not client specific. We don't customize for any client. It's one platform. We had a client who spoke to another prospective client as a reference check and they said, yeah, these guys are great. They customize everything for us. So the prospect comes and says, you said you wouldn't customize, but you customize for them. Why not us? And I said, we haven't customized. The experience you get feels customized because it's going to do everything you need it to do, period, right? And a little bit it doesn't do, managed services does. So, so I don't know if there are any resources out there that I could point people to. And I, I say this honestly in the context of I had done another startup. There was a VC-backed startup in, in 2000. Uh, I, with two partners, got venture capital funding. We grew it. We exited, and it was a profitable exit for the VC and us. Right? So I've done that side of it. I've gone with the big money. And the number of mistakes we made and the number of places in hindsight, and I was a CEO, I realized we could have done it more effectively are all of the lessons I've brought in here. So my job this time was very simple. My granddad moved from India to Kenya. He bootstrapped, he became one of the, he was a very successful businessman in East Africa. Um, and he started a lot of different in industries and all of that, but he bootstrapped, he had nothing when he went. So I was asking myself if he can bootstrap it. And if that's how businesses started 50, 100 years ago, why do we need all this venture capital stuff? Can we actually bootstrap a technology business? So I've wanted to prove that. And I think I have. Part of the reason for proving that is just very specifically Orlando-centric, right? I mean, we're the center of the world when it comes to phenomenal experiences. We have one of the largest universities in the country that churns out technologists like there's no tomorrow. We should be a hotbed for startups and entrepreneurs. And anyone that says you can't do a startup in Orlando because we don't have access to solid funding and real VCs, well, I'm proof you can. And I'm, I know others will. And I know over the last five years, we've probably seen more successful tech startups out of Orlando than we did the previous 15. But you know, I, I think we're on a journey to prove that small without funding can work, large with funding can work, um, and, and there are all sorts of different models. Yeah, yeah, definitely. At the end of the day, it's very domain specific on what you need to be competitive. And, you know, there's some domains, yeah. which, of course, you need a lot of funding to even be able to get some chips on the table. Some you do. Yeah. And, and software much less so now than it used to be, right? Hardware is a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or depending on how early you are. But like I said, uh, you know, five years ago compared to today, there are tools and things available today that you know, like sentiment analysis. I mean, we spent half a million bucks early on building a sentiment analytics engine because there wasn't one available five years ago. Today, there's a Google API and that API outperforms everybody else's in terms of sentiment recognition. It's phenomenal. And it costs pennies for a thousand. So, you know, what cost me half a million bucks today would cost me nothing except to write to an API. So it's, a, you know, the, the technology, particularly from an AI and a mic, what I call a narrow AI perspective, right? Broad AI is challenging. Narrow AI, we're specifically going and applying machine learning and um, all of that stuff to a very narrow domain. There are a lot of powerful platforms on which you can build applications. And building applications doesn't need to be an arm and a leg cost. Google's already spent the money building the infrastructure, right? Or Amazon has. So, so it's, it's a great time to be a tech startup. Yeah, absolutely. 
That's awesome. This is great. Um, Sanjay, I really appreciate you taking some time with us. Before I let you go, um, do you have any asks for the community or for the audience? Anything that you would like uh, help with? Um, any hiring? No, I think I'm good. Yeah. Is this targeted to the Orlando community? Primarily Orlando, yeah. Central Florida and Orlando. But you never know. Yeah. So, so the ask is, I would ask people that are thinking about starting tech companies and looking outside Orlando to do it, to say, it can be done here. And, and you know, if anybody has any questions of how we did it, and it wasn't easy. I, you know, it looks easy once you've succeeded. It was painful, but there are lessons I've learned along the way, mistakes I wouldn't make. Um, not huge ones, because we didn't have a lot of money to make huge mistakes. But I, you know, I'd be happy to talk to anyone that's looking outside Orlando to do a tech startup to say, you know, this is a better place than really most other places you can think of. That's great. That is uh, very helpful. Thanks for um, taking a few minutes, Sanjay. I wish you all the best. Um, you know, as, as a local Orlando startup, um, myself and the tech community are very proud of you. Wish you all the success uh, that you deserve. You've taken it so far with uh, basically a bootstrapped effort that you have is a real great achievement and uh, hope hope you have continued success on that on that space. Thank you. It, it doesn't happen without support from folks like yourselves in the Orlando community, like I said, but um, it, it's been fun so far. We'll see how it goes the next year and two. Absolutely. All right. Thanks so much, Sanjay. Have a great one. Thank you. Thank you.